Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to formally welcome you to the MAPC uh, 2021 Winter Council Meeting. Uh, my name is Erin Wartman. I am MAPC's president, and I am thrilled uh, that you all have joined us, either on video, on the phone, or just watching uh, in the comfort of wherever you are on YouTube or in syndication. I really appreciate you taking time to engage or to be informed. Um, on, um, on this lovely sunny morning. So uh, before uh, we kind of get going here, um, I am going to kind of do some housekeeping where uh, we, I describe the meeting technologies, norms for participation and voting. So uh, just so everyone's clear, even though we're almost a year in now, uh, this open meeting of the MAPC Council is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, which suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which is posted along with the agenda on MAPC's website at www.mapc.org backslash about slash MAPC backslash legal slash notices slash meetings allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable access is afforded. So the public may follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Accordingly, the public may view the proceedings live streamed uh, at uh, youtube.com backslash user backslash MAPC Metro Boston. For this meeting, the MAPC Council is convening its members by video conference via Zoom. Council members receive their login credentials when registering for the meeting. If you have not already done so, uh, council members, I will ask you to please rename yourself with your full name and affiliation. So for me, it is Erin Wartman, Town of Stoneham, or um, for instance, like Juan Vega, E-O-H-E-D. Um, the way to do that is on the top right um, uh, corner of your video. If you are in video, uh, just click on those three little dots there and there's a rename option. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded as I'm sure you all get the notification uh, when we started and that most council members are participating by video uh, conference. So accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you. And if you are able to um, share your screen, um, uh, I ask that you do that, please. And the recording of this meeting will be available again on youtube.com backslash user backslash MAPC Metro Boston. So I wanna go over um, some meeting business ground rules. I know very exciting. Um, we're gonna be turning to the first item very quickly on the agenda, but before we do so, uh, please allow me to cover a few ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes, which I know Heidi really appreciates. Um, so we try and do our best to really capture it that way. And we have shared expectations for these, uh, for these meetings. So number one, please remember your phone or computer should be muted unless you are asked to speak. Uh, that way we don't have a lot of noise all at once. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. So um, sometimes uh, if you are speaking for discussion, it is super helpful if um, you can say your name and your affiliation uh, before you speak. Um, and finally, we will be utilizing the Zoom chat feature for all motions, seconds, and voting. We will need to be able to identify you throughout the meeting. So again, please ensure that you have identified yourself and you understand how to use the Zoom chat feature and how to raise your hand. If you look at the bar at the bottom of the Zoom screen, one of the buttons should say chat. It's the image of the chat bubble. If you click on that, uh, it will bring you to the chat. 
make sure you are messaging everyone instead of the host or one of the co-hosts. Um, I would recommend you do that now since uh, we had that great icebreaker while we kind of waited to start and I gave my answer uh, to an individual participant. So I'm sorry, Anna, uh, for answering the icebreaker to you individually first. Um, and again, if you look at the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, one of the buttons should say participants. And that's the outline of the person. The participants box will show up on the right side when you click on that button. And at the bottom right of the participant box, it will be a button to raise and lower your hand. If you have any difficulties, please identify the problem in the chat feature and an MAPC staff member will assist you. So essentially, uh, we are going to be utilizing the chat feature, so I would recommend as well opening your chat feature now, so we're able to kind of, uh, you're able to utilize that as we go. And council members who must call in rather than join by video will be asked by our technical support team to identify themselves to the team. The technical support uh, staff will rename those callers. Voting by phone participants will be oral and will occur after all other have voted on a given motion. So at this time, I'm gonna request Heidi, our operations manager to call roll. Um, Heidi uh, did take attendance between 9.15 and 9.30 while council members were in the waiting room. We will ask members to identify themselves as present or here in the chat function for the recording of the meeting. Uh, roll will be called to identify council members who have not yet identified themselves. Members will be called in alphabetical order by last name for gubernatorial members and then by seat name for ex officio members. If the ex officio designee is not present, Heidi will call on the holder of the seat. Roll of the cities and towns will be in alphabetical order by municipality name. If the city or town rep is not present, Heidi will then call on the alternate representative. Heidi asks council members to prepare to respond by typing present or here in the Zoom chat feature as she calls their name or city and town. Phone participants will be asked to unmute and asked to identify themselves verbally as present or here. Take it away, Heidi. Thank you, Erin. Good morning, everybody. I believe I am unmuted. I just can't tell. Okay, excellent. All right, we're going to start with the ex officio seats. Um, Board of Directors, MBTA, the designee is Catherine Benash. Chaired, Chair of the Board of Directors of Massport, the designee is Joelle Barrera. Designee for Mass DOT Highway Administration, John Bouchard. Boston Water and Sewer Commission, designee is Sean Canty. Board of Director, Chair of the Board of Directors of MassDOT is David Moeller. Commissioner of the DCR, Jim Montgomery. Boston Public Works and Streets, Chris Osgood. Courtney Rainey is the designee for DEP. Vandana Rao is the designee for the chair of the board of directors of the MWRA. Lauren Shirtliff is the designee for the chair of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Juan Vega is the secretary E the designee for the secretary of EOHED. And Elaine Vanya is the designee for the director of DHCD. Okay, we'll go through all the gubernatorial appointees now, who I have not captured. Sharonda Almeida, Zamawa Arenas, Lisa Browdy, Karen Canfield, Sol Carbonell, Kelly Chung, Robert Cohen, John Featherston, Daniel Garcia de Coteau, I'm sorry about butchering your name, Jaron Johnson, Angie Liu, 
Gina Martinez, Matilda McGee Tubb, Richard Pila, Sam Seidel, Steve Silvera, Romani Stripada, Kelly Strong, Monica Tibbetts Nutt, Bill Tinty, and Sam Wong. Okay, we will run through the cities next. Um, as Aaron said, please say present when um, your community is called. Um, for Beverly, um, Michael Cahill. For Boston, John Barrows. Boston alternate, Caitlin Passafaro. Braintree, James Downey. Cambridge, Jeff Roberts. Cambridge Alt, Bill Degnan. Chelsea, John DePriest. Everett, Tony Souza. Everett Alternate Rep, Marzi Galaska. Framingham, Mary Von Spicer. Framingham Alt, Thatcher Keezer. Franklin, um, Amy Love. Lynn, James Marsh. Malden, Deborah Burke. Marlboro, Meredith Harris. Medford, Alicia Hunt. Medford, alternate rep, Annie Streetman. Melrose, Denise Gaffey. Newton, Jennifer Kyra. Newton alternate, Zachary Lamel. Peabody, Kurt Bellavance. Quincy, Frank Tramontazzi. Quincy alternate rep, James Fatsius. Randolph, Michelle Tyler. Revere, Tech Lang. Salem, Tom Daniel. Somerville, Mayor Curtitone. Somerville Alt Rep, George Proakis. Waltham, Catherine Cagle. Watertown, Stephen Magoon. Weymouth, Mayor Headland. Weymouth Alt Rep, Carl Edsel. Winthrop, Austin Faison. Woburn, Tina Cassidy, and Woburn Alt Rep, Dan Orr. Okay, we will move on to the towns. Acton, Joan Gardner. Arlington, Jenny Rate. Arlington Alt Rep, Adam Chapdelaine. Ashland, Yolanda Greaves. Bedford, Sandra Hackman. Bedford Alt Rep. Margaret Fleischman, Bellingham, Jim Kupfer, Bolton, Erica Urardi, Fox, uh, excuse me, Boxborough, Les Fox, Boxborough Alt Rep, Cindy Markowitz, Brookline, Allison Steinfeld, Brookline Alt Rep, Kara Bruton, Burlington, Michael W. Espejo. Burlington Alt Rep, Melissa Tintoncalis. Canton, Laura Smead. Cohasset, Lauren Lind. Danvers, Aaron Henry. Dedham, Jeremy Rosenberg. Dedham Alt Rep, John Cison. Dover, Christopher Dwelly. Dover Alt Rep, John Jeffries. Duxbury, Valerie Massard. Duxbury Alt Rep, George Wadsworth. Essex, Peter Fippen. Foxborough, Paige Duncan. Hanover, Ann Lee. Hanover Alt Rep, Joseph Colangelo. Hingham, David Allschuler. 
Holbrook, Timothy Gordon, Holliston, Tina Hind, Hopkinton, Amy Ritterbush, Hopkinton Alt Rep, Elaine Lazarus, Hudson, Christina Johnson, Hall, Chris Diorio, Ipswich, Carolyn Britt, Ipswich Alt Rep, William Pollitz, Lexington, Richard Canale, Littleton, Keith Bergman, Linfield, Robert Dolan, Linfield Alt Rep, Emily Katamar Martori, Marblehead, Steve Leverone, Marblehead Alt Rep, Rebecca Curran Cutting, Maynard, Krista Silva, Medfield, Sarah Raposa, Medway, Barbara St. Andre, Middleton, Andrew Sheehan, Middleton Alt Rep, Katrina O'Leary, Milford, Joseph Calagione, okay, Millis, Robert Weiss, Millis Alt Rep, Nicole Riley, Milton, Tabor Keeley, Nahant, Allison Ackerman, Natick, James Freeze, Natick Alt Rep, Joshua Ostroff, Needham, Mo Handel, Norfolk, Richard McCarthy, North Reading, Daniel McKnight, North Reading Alt Rep, Michael Gilberto, Norwell, Jason Brown, Norwood, Paul Halkiotis, Reading Alt Rep, Jean Delios, Rockland, Jennifer Constable, Rockport, Harry Korsland, Rockport Alt Rep, Tom Micus, Saugus, Jeanette Fasano, Situate, James Boudreau, Situate Alt Rep, Brad Washburn, Sharon, Susan Price, Sherburn, Marion Neutra, Stoneham, President Wartman, Stoneham Alt Rep, Rachel Meredith Warren, Stoughton, Lou Guido, Stoughton Alt Rep, Pamela McCarthy, Stowe, Jesse Stedman, Stowe Alt Rep, Ellen Sturgis, Sudbury, Adam Duchesno. Sudbury Alt Rep, Beth Sudmeyer. Topsfield, Kevin Hart Harutunian. Topsfield Alt Rep, Donna Rich. Wakefield, Aaron Coquinda. Walpole, Paul Connolly. Walpole Alt Rep, Ashley Clark. Wellesley, Colette E. O'Frank, and um, Alt Rep, Beverly Sullivan Woods, Wenham, Margaret Hoffman, Weston, Ime Kalani Ow, Westwood, Steve Olinoff, Westwood Alt, William DeLay, Wilmington, Valerie Gingrich, Winchester, Brian Zell Kelly, Rentham, Rachel Benson, and Rentham Alt, Kevin A. Sweet. And that is, and we are at quorum. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heidi. And thank you all for being really patient during that. Um, yeah. I really appreciate it. Um, um, so next up on the agenda, oh, went ahead there a little bit. Uh, next up on the agenda, I just wanted, um, we're going to be entering into the business part of the meeting now that the housekeeping is done. I want to remind all council members that all motions, seconds, and voting will be done in the chat section. Um, and please just be patient with myself or anyone else who is running the meeting when it comes to motions and seconds and amendments. Um, 
with raising your hand. Um, we have 148 people on this chat. Uh, so needless to say, I have six pages of faces in front of me. So if I don't see you immediately uh, raising your hand, please, um, it is not personal. Uh, we are all uh, going to practice patience and we're just doing the best we can. So uh, at, with that being said, and I appreciate you all for that. Um, I'm gonna ask for a motion to approve the minutes from the 2020 fall council meeting. And that um, motion or second will be done in the chat. And um, as soon as I see it, I will uh, acknowledge that. So I'm looking, Okay, great. I'm looking for a motion or a second to um, in the chat to accept the fall 2020 council minutes. Erin, I think we have several uh, motions and seconds in the chat already. I, okay, my chat, this is a problem. I don't, um, I'm not seeing a chat. <laughs> My chat is not updating. Up. Oh. All right. Well, I I think since since we can try and deal with that, but since we okay. since several of us do see it, I think we okay. can go on and hold the vote probably. Okay. Could you just um, tell me, Mark, then who motioned and who second, please? Uh, yes. According to mine, there are several, but let's take. Uh, Frank Tremontosi from Quincy, who moved, and Valerie Massard, who I believe is from Duxbury, who seconded. Okay, thank you all. I'm so sorry about that. I'm like, where is everyone's motion in second? Okay, if there are any questions, uh, please answer that in the chat. I'm so sorry about that. I'm not seeing any questions, so um, hopefully that is the same for you all as well. Um, Okay, great. Thank you, Sasha, uh, for that nonverbal. Um, so at this time, if you um, are voting in support to approve those motions, do so by typing I in the chat right now. And those opposed would be the nays. And any abstentions? I am going to assume the motion passes. Can someone give me a nonverbal thumbs up from MAPC? Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Boy, these tech, this tech stuff, man. Not so, I thought I, thought I was good. Not so much this morning, but thank you. Uh, that motion passes. So actually at this time, um, I'm actually gonna try and deal with these tech issues. So at this time, I'm actually going to call up Vice President Adam Chapdelaine, who is going to kind of take over and intro um, the next part of our business meeting. So Adam. I am sure that he is um, going to be with us momentarily. Okay. Well, you know, I will. Sasha needs to unmute. Oh, okay. Sorry. Adam, you are able to unmute yourself. You are a co host. Um, and someone just let me know that I, I guess there's a lot of Verizon outages today. So that could, there might be some different um, issues with that throughout the day. So, um, great. Well, Verizon is not a subsidiary of MAPC. So at least, at least I'm glad of that. Um, <laughs> let us uh, try for just another moment to see if uh, Adam Chapdelaine can make his way through to uh, be heard. If that is not the case, I think we would ask, there he, no, it won't let me unmute according to Adam. Okay, that's, 
strange. It's okay. It's okay. We can, we can handle this. We are all professionals here uh, and we will work through these tech issues. No big deal. So how about this? How about I intro um, our next part, uh, part of the business meeting? So I am actually going to call on our treasurer, Sam Seidel, to give a report of the treasurer. And uh, Sam, I am totally going to be focused on you, but um, I'm going to multitask. I'm going to figure out my tech issue. Hopefully Adam can figure out his tech issue and um, take it away, Sam. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And I hope everybody can hear me. Um, and as, as they always say, we will figure this out together. Uh, I am Sam Seidel. I'm the treasurer of MAPC. And I've got two uh, orders of business uh, for my report today. The first is the mid-year budget review. And that is the process that we go through every time, right around this time of year, where we've drafted a budget back in April. And we go through about six months of the year. And then we look at that budget again. And we true up the numbers to make sure that our numbers are good so that, and I love this phrase, so that we can land the plane on June 30th at the end of the fiscal year. That's the process we're going through today. We're gonna, you got in your packet, uh, the summary uh, updated budget. And I'm gonna dig into that a little bit more, uh, give you a little bit more detail. And then uh, it's the hope of not only the finance committee, but the executive committee that we can get approval of that new adjusted budget to take us through the end of FY21. So uh, overall picture, big big picture. We'll do big picture. We'll go into the revenue a little bit. We'll go into the spending a little bit, and then I'll just do a brief wrap up. The big picture is that um, we have a very positive revenue picture. Back in April, you'll remember it was COVID times. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty, and MAPC, as it always does, approach the problem very conservatively. Let's generate a budget that is safe and strong. As it turns out, uh, a lot more work has happened during the course of the year than we thought might have happened back in April. Um, that's point number one, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing for the agency, and it's a good thing for the work they've been doing. Because, and you'll see the numbers, uh, there is enough work, so much work, some of that will get deferred to a future fiscal year, which is also good because it sets us up well for FY22, which is, was another point of concern that the actual fiscal impacts of COVID would not be felt necessarily immediately, but they would show up in the out years. And so the fact that we can defer some of this work to future fiscal years is a positive. Um, of course, with more work and revenue means there is more work to do, which means there's more staffing that needs to happen. And the agency is in the midst of doing that. Uh, and that will show up in future budgets. They won't show up so much in this budget as you'll see, uh, but they will show up in future, future years uh, because those people will be onboarded and, and that work will happen then. Let's uh, just spend a, a second on the, on the total revenue line, which is the top line of the summary sheet you got. Uh, it's the revenue part of the budget. Uh, just to pull out a couple of specifics so you can see or know a little bit more detail what's actually going on here. Local technical assistance up by huge amounts. There was a big question how much cities and towns would do planning type work during the COVID time. As it turns out, a lot did uh, to the tune of 30 new projects, 30, uh, over 30 new projects that didn't show up in the April budget, but have happened over the course of the year. The EOEEA Smart Growth Grants is a different section of it. Um, that is brought in up to uh, over $315,000 of new work. I, I say, and I believe this is accurate, everything we applied for, we were granted. So there's a real desire to have MAPC doing this work and that work happened during this COVID time. Public health, as you can imagine, uh, MAPC has been dragged in, that's the wrong word, but brought into the public health sphere in ways maybe they didn't even necessarily expect. COVID has put huge strains on localities to try to work through both the issue of, of COVID and the quarantine, and now we're into vaccination phase. Um, there's over $600,000 specifically earmarked towards COVID-related work. There's a lot more work that's, that's COVID-related uh, in the budget, but there's specifically called out around $600,000 of additional work there. That's all pass-through work, but it, it speaks to the impact 
um, that uh, COVID has had. And then under transportation, here's, here's another big one that you'll see in the final numbers. Uh, the taxi transportation partnership that's done in, in partnership with mass development started out at about 144,000 back in April. It's been bumped up to $3.4 million. So there's just a huge amount of new revenue has shown up um, in, in the budget. Let's, uh, let's and, and I'll just go through the whole thing. If, if we have questions, we can do those at the end. On the expense side, so that's the other, the other side of the budget is, you know, what are we spending the money on? Uh, if you looked down at total indirect expenses, you'll see that actually those numbers match up almost exactly. The amount we predicted we would spend back in April and the amount we now think we're going to spend is almost exactly right on line. It's, it's negative $937, which is de minimis to say the least. However, it's important to point out that COVID changed a lot as, as you all have experienced and certainly MAPC experienced. People were working from home, that bumped up telecommunications costs, it bumped up IT consulting costs, but it also bumped down and reductions in travel and in in-person meetings. Of course, there was almost none of those happening. So those costs went down. Um, also, it presented the challenge with people at home, particularly parents of small children, that ability to manage, as they say, the work-life balance. And if you have, and some, I'm sure many of you have had to deal with this too, if you have small children at home running around, that required a sort of reshifting, and that had some expenditure uh, impacts. Nevertheless, the takeaway, the bottom line, is that we are exactly where we thought we were, except we're a little bit less to the tune of $937. We are also uh, targeted to hit our overhead rate, which is the other important thing that we track constantly, vigilantly at 123%. So all of this goes to say that there's a lot of additional revenue coming in. A good portion of that is passed through money. Some of that is gonna be deferred to future years and our expenditures have held very steady. Um, takeaways, biggest takeaways, the conservative approach to budgeting that MAPC always employs has served us very well. The numbers have turned out much better uh, than we thought might be the case back in April, and that's very good for the agency. The total net additional new revenue is $6.2 million, which is a lot. As I say, as we saw in the taxi program, some of that is passed through. But nevertheless, that's a big bump up in the revenue. Uh, and that brings our total revised budget to 26.1 million up from the 19.9 million that we had passed uh, back in the spring, summer. Um, 15.5 million of that is gonna be deferred to future years. That's a good thing because it, it helps set us up for FY22, which was always a big question mark in everybody's mind, what that out year, what that first out year and maybe even the second out year was, was gonna look like after COVID. So that's good. And the final takeaway is that uh, more staff needs to be brought on board. That's a lot of additional work. And so um, MAPC is in the process of doing that. I know they have at least four people lined up and that will uh, continue. They have uh, plenty more in uh, the pipeline as well. That concludes my report. I would entertain questions or comments. Uh, unfortunately, on my screen, I see Aaron. I don't see others. And I see that Mark has commented on the taxi delivery program and Tabor Keeley has moved to accept the mid-year budget. John DePriest has seconded it. Is there any discussion at this point? Hearing none. Uh, Mark, did you, were there any comments from MAPC? No, no, I just, uh, I'm seeing no, uh, no questions in the chat. So I think we should proceed to a vote. Okay, so with that, uh, motion by Tabor Keeley, second by John DePriest. All the ayes please vote first.
uh, I see a question. Richard Pilla has a question regarding the budget. Um, we are in the middle of a vote. All right, so we have to, let's get through this vote. Eyes continue to vote. If, um, if we have, we'll let, let those run another minute. Seems like the eyes are pretty much done. I think we can ask people to um, okay. do the nays and the, um, and the abstentions, Sam, if you will. Sure, so now I would call, Richard, I see your comment. Uh, I would call on the nays, any noes, please vote now. Seeing none, that there's a no. We, yeah, I think we should. Um, we we can't um, we can't stop in the middle of a vote, but we can certainly entertain Richard's question afterwards, and uh, would be glad to respond to it as best we are able. Sure. And then abstentions. Any abstentions? <laughs> please vote. Please vote now. Uh, seeing no abstentions, that concludes the vote. Uh, uh, yes, and, and let me just uh, thank you. Thanks to Sheila Winter, who is uh, always rock solid and helps me endlessly in this process of learning about these things and getting up to speed for these reports. So thank you, Sheila. And your note is noted uh, that the 15 million that I mentioned is deferred uh, in deferred revenue is in addition to the 26 million uh, revised for FY21. That is a correction on what I said earlier. So thank you, Sheila, for saying that. And that is the new corrected number there. Um, Mark, uh, Richard Pilla voted no. He had a question on the budget. And yeah, I think respectfully, we, I'm sorry we didn't get to it beforehand because we didn't see it until we were in the middle of the vote. But Richard, if you can either unmute yourself or if we can unmute you, I'm a little unclear what the technical process is. We would be glad to um, discuss that question at this time. Am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, Richard. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, with the overhead. Uh, how many square feet does the uh, MAPC occupy at its, uh, in its offices in town? Oh, I'm, I'm unable to say how many square feet. We have basically two and a half floors of our building. Okay. And it's possible that someone would know. All right. And the number of staff that work uh, uh, on site versus- Approximately 100. 100. Now, of course, no one's on site now. Right. But we- we expect to be back on site and, and that's, that's our, that's our number, always adding a few and losing a few and, you know, in any given month. Certainly. Um, so moving forward, uh, what will the position be of uh, people um, of MAPC, um, those working on site versus remotely? And if there is going to be a significant number of staff working remotely, Will they need the amount of space that they currently um, uh, occupy? And has been has there been any uh, discussion about reducing the amount of space if yes. a significant number of people are going to be working remotely? So I would say this is a complex question, which uh, Rebecca and I would be glad to discuss with you more afterwards. I'll give a summary. Uh, we do have an internal team working on post-COVID reopening. There are a whole host of issues that are involved in that effort. Uh, they include, of course, questions of how many people will be working remotely, how many people will be working on site, and what the average number of days in the office will be for staff. As you'll see during our future of work presentation, if we can get to it later in this meeting, uh, that is a question that a lot of employers are facing at the moment. We are aware of the fact that it may be appropriate to reduce the footprint, but at the same time, we have many years left on our lease at the moment. And... Um, and we will, we will be considering that question. One of the issues that, that people often face uh, in discussing this is, is the, the great technical difficulty not of having a meeting remotely or having a meeting in person, but having a meeting that's hybrid. And we're thinking about all of those things and thinking about them from the perspective of space as well. I assure you that when our lease is up, we will try and rent the smallest possible space 
uh, from a consistent with a budgetary perspective, from a budgetary perspective, in order to meet our needs. Okay. Last question: When does the uh, your uh, lease uh, expire? Um, I think it's 2024, but um, yes, it is. Jen is is confirming that it's 2024. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And I'm sorry we weren't able to address that uh, prior to the vote. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Okay, so the next order of business that's on my uh, plate is the FY 2022 local assessment. This is the annual assessment that happens every year. It's the two and a half percent increase. It's it's this is the only way to uh, for MAPC to get these monies and it is spread out across uh, the entire region. Um, I would make the point, we just heard the story of the agency with a lot of additional revenue. A lot of that revenue that we talked about is passed through money. It is either earmarked for very specific things or it's gonna pass through the agency. This money, the assessment money is the most flexible dollars that the agency has and Uh, You may or may not know that MAPC has been called on in huge numbers of ways uh, when this pandemic hit, including dealing with COVID and the quarantine issues and the vaccine issues and the public health and the public safety issues. We have every expectation that will continue into the upcoming year. Um, I would also note that there's always a compounding loss issue with the assessment if we forego it in any sense. It's not money we can recoup in the future. The executive committee, uh, the finance committee first on the executive committee reviewed this uh, and recommended it to the executive committee. The the executive committee uh, had it before them, discussed it, and also recommended its adoption uh, before you. We, so I'll open it up to any discussion. If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the FY22 local assessment as presented. We have a motion from um, Mo Handel and a second from Jenny Rate. All right, so I see motion from Mo Handel, second from Jenny Rate, uh, discussion on the matter. Hearing none. No, Alicia from Medford has raised her hand. Alicia from Medford, sorry, yes, oh. there you are. Sorry, go ahead, Alicia. Hi. Could you please just say a few words about why in this time of difficult budgets for the cities that you want to move forward on the annual? I realize that you've discussed it. I feel like it would be appropriate to just share some of those thoughts with the members. Why, while this is a very standard expected increase that um, you feel that it's necessary to move forward even though this is a very, very difficult financial time and the amount is very minimal to our communities. So I'll I go would, um, first, and then maybe Mark. Uh, just to repeat what uh, what I said is my uh, my read on it is these are the most flexible dollars. It is the the burden is is distributed by population. So the bigger communities, Boston, Cambridge, uh, are face a very different world than Carlisle, Acton. Um, let me not go further than that and say, Mark, I'm sure you have lots. Yeah, sure, we'll talk a little bit about it. So under Prop Two and a Half, uh, Alicia, the um, the only way that we can increase the assessment revenue is by a two and a half percent voted by our council. It's available on an annual basis. Um, it is adjusted by the Department of Revenue based on population. They do that calculation every year. It requires a two thirds vote of support by the council. And um, unlike cities and towns, this originates in prop two and a half, like so many of the other things that we face, the number isn't magical, that's where it comes from. And unlike cities and towns, there's no, there's no new growth provision and there's no override. So it is literally the only way that we can keep up with inflation. It's also about one fifteenth of our total budget and about, I think about one, actually about one seventh of our total budget and about 20% of our operating budget. And it is the only money that isn't tied to a specific contract or program. So when, for example, a pandemic hits, and suddenly we have to help Revere and Chelsea to establish a new quarantine facility in, the, in a vacant hotel. Uh, and and you know, we're not under any contract to do that and we never expected it would happen. We have to turn the assessment dollars in order to help them to open up that hospital. 
And um, that has certainly been the case throughout the pandemic. Uh, the Sunday calls with about 100 mayors and managers and epidemiological experts that Lizzie Wayant um, uh, does almost every week for a while and a little less frequently now, but we have another one coming up. Also, that has to be funded by assessment. Uh, the assistance that we're providing to cities and towns to figure out a vaccination program that works for them, which is both a matter of weekly calls, sometimes twice a week between municipal officials in the state, but it's also a matter of helping, for example, a group of eight communities north of Boston to see if they can establish a regional vaccination facility. Same thing, we have to go to assessment for that. And every time a city and town calls us and says, we need a little help, a couple of hours help on a planning issue that's not COVID related, but we don't charge them for that and there's no contract for that, but we bill those two hours to assessment. So it really means that some of our departments, they end up having assessment allocations of like $10,000, $15,000 to do this work over the course of the year. The $45,000 in additional assessment that will come in this year and every year subsequently is modest in its impact on individual cities. I think Medford is about $500 more a year. Uh, I know one community is $3 a year, uh, but it's big for us because it's flexible and allows us to respond to the needs that communities bring to our attention. So it, we don't take it lightly, uh, especially at these times. We delayed the implementation of the assessment increase last year, um, but in this case, we feel we need it. We need to respond, particularly to the demands being placed upon us by our cities and towns to address COVID response and now looking forward COVID vaccination and recovery. Seeing no other questions, comments, uh, we have a motion, we have a second. I would call for the vote and I would call for ayes. People voting aye, please vote now. Uh, I believe we have the eyes. If you haven't voted yet, please vote now. Uh, in the meantime, I will call for the no's. If you're voting no, please vote now. Seeing no no's, abstentions, please indicate that now. I believe we have completed the voting. I, I would just note, I wish to be recorded in the, in the affirmative on both counts, the mid-year budget, which I didn't forgot to vote and also on the assessment. So I hope Heidi, if you can record that. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, that uh, completes the, the report of the treasurer. Uh, I wanna thank you all. And I believe I'm handing it back. I'm not sure to Adam or to Aaron. To Adam. I Adam. think Adam's on board yeah. and has solved his muting problem. So excellent. Yep. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate okay. your time. Thank, thank you, Sam. Sam. Yep. Um, Alyssa would like to just quickly um, say thank you for the explanation. So I am asking her to unmute. Sure. I just wanted to say before the vote, but that's okay. Thank you. Like, yep. I really appreciated that we needed to hear that as a body that sort of robust about what was different about this year. Great, thank you, Alicia. Uh, thank you, everybody, and thanks for your patience with me. I, just when you think you've figured out Zoom after a year, or something uh, finds its way to go wrong. Uh, so, uh, so, and again, thank you, Sam, for that very thorough presentation and for the body support of uh, both of those both of those items. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jennifer Garcia to talk about a proposed bylaw change dealing uh, with the way we treat quorum for these meetings. So, uh, Jennifer, if you could uh, unmute and present. There you go. Thank you. There she is. Okay. You said you weren't allowing me to unmute myself. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just, I'm Jennifer Garcia. I am uh, filling in for Margie Weinberger, a new general counsel, and I just wanted to discuss the bylaw change um, before you. 
Uh, essentially, we're changing quorum for council meetings from one third of the members of the council to a majority of the members of the council. And this change is both in line with current law, but also reflective of MAPC's current practice. So we wanted to take this time to update that and codify it. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, do we have, uh, could, could I ask for a motion and a second before discussion? We have a motion. John DePriest. Thank We have a motion from John DePriest. Do we have a second? Seconded by Yolanda. Uh, are there any questions, comments, or feedback on the motion? There, there's a question in the chat. Is it mandated by law? Yes, I would answer that. It basically is. The, okay. the requirement under open meeting is for a majority quorum. So we want to... I, I think our, our bylaws in this, this case might have predated the open meeting law, they're so old. So we, we wanted to bring it into a, a, a full uh, consistency, not only with the laws, but with our current practice. Great, thank you, Mark. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, um, I will ask uh, if everybody who's Voting aye, to please do so in the chat. Okay, I think we're close to running out of steam on the aye votes. Um, if you're uh, choosing to vote nay, if you could do so in the chat now. Okay, seeing none uh, and any abstentions? Okay, looks like the motion carries. Thank you, Jennifer, appreciate it. All right, and I believe next, uh, I am turning this over to Mark for the executive director's report. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for persisting with us through this meeting. Our, our number of participants has remained rock, remained rock solid at over 160 despite the technical difficulties. I know that some of you have had to leave and rejoin perhaps because of the Verizon difficulty. But, uh, but thank you for, for persisting with us and staying with us. Um, honestly, I should thank Alicia because I ended up saying most of what I was going to say in the executive director's report and responding to her question about the assessment. Because honestly, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the tremendous amount of work that my staff has done uh, on COVID response and now COVID vaccinations and recovery. I mean, we, we, were, we were texting back and forth about teacher vaccinations this morning, starting at, I think, around 7.30, uh, which is the subject of a, uh, an announcement that I think the governor is making at this hour or has made at this hour. You know, a lot of MAPC's work is quiet and behind the scenes. We get into the press a little. Uh, we get into the press a lot with some of our research, but, but very frequently, the work that we're doing behind the scenes is focused on getting cities and towns and the state to hear each other, to understand each other, and to work toward a common solution. And that's not something that people hear about all that frequently, but it has been the single-minded purpose of the staff at MAPC throughout this pandemic, to get people working together, to bring the numbers down, to deal with some of the dramatic equity challenges that we saw initially with the disease and which we now, the disease and the recession, and which we now see with the, uh, with the vaccine. And I, I can't say enough about people's commitment, uh, the staff and also many board members uh, to help us to do this work day in and day out now for almost a year, the day we left the office, March 16th, only around the corner from now. Uh, we are all beginning to see a light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not out of the tunnel. And we are all hoping that the numbers will hold and that we will not see a resurgence. It is still possible that we will if we relax too much, uh, either from a state level policy perspective or from a personal perspective in terms of protecting ourselves. But we have vaccines going into arms and I think people have a sense of hope in the spring as well. And uh, MAPC is gonna still be there with everyone to try and provide support 
If there are issues related to the vaccine that are facing your city, your town, your agency, your community organization, or your business, we have staff that can help. Sometimes they can help directly. Sometimes they can help by referring you to a person with greater expertise in answering that particular question. But we are available to do that. We may not be sitting in our offices, but we're kind of in the office all day long, it seems. I know that that's true for many of you as well. One of the issues that has come to the fore during the pandemic, and Richard's question earlier sort of alluded to this indirectly, is what is the future of work going to be? Uh, where are we going to be working from? Is it going to change our living patterns? How does it relate to ongoing trends that we saw before the pandemic, but maybe are unjustly being blamed on the pandemic at the moment, even though they were going on a long time ago? And what can we learn from the changes we're just beginning to see as people start to get back into a normal rhythm? What can we learn from those early tea leaves to tell us what might be happening a year, five years, 10 years down the road? Of course, one challenging thing for MAPC, as you all know, is we, this pandemic struck right in the middle of trying to create our new regional plan, Metro Common 2050. So we've had to address these issues right up front in the planning process for Metro Common. We've been conducting a lot of research to look at these questions and to try and provide some, some answers, or if not actual answers, at least the glimmer of answers, some scenarios that might happen going forward that we can begin to plan for now so that we have the right public policies in place at the state level and at the municipal level. And we're very fortunate to have a great team of staff Sarah Philbrick and Connor Gately, both from Data Services, and uh, Betsy Cowan Neptune, uh, who is our Chief of Economic Development, who have begun to unveil some of this information for us, or will begin to unveil some of this information for us in a presentation they have for us today. I might note that Governor Baker asked uh, for a consultant uh, just the other day to look at the future of work and uh, we, uh, you know, we expect that he will choose someone fairly quickly. And as I said to Secretary Keneally yesterday, MAPC is not waiting, we've already started. And I'm hoping that that will add to the, not only the debate, but, but the understanding of what's going on, why it's going on, and help us to make some good decisions in terms of public policy and spending. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Sarah. I think Sarah and will be speaking first and then Betsy. And then we will have a period of questions for all three of the panelists, including Connor. Sarah Philbert, turning it over to you. Thanks, Mark. And thank you all for having me and uh, getting through all of the uh, introductory and, and business part of the meeting. I know that some folks um, from Betsy's um, Economic Development Advisory Committee are on the line so for joining us. Um, my name is Sarah Philbrick. As Mark said, I am a senior research analyst in our data services department, and I'll be joined by Betsy Cowan Neptune, um, who is our chief of economic development, um, to talk to you today about, as Mark said, the future of work in Metro Boston. So before we talk about how the pandemic has really shifted things in our region and um, what the future might look like, I want to talk through some pre-pandemic trends that we've been seeing for the past few decades. The first major trend is wage polarization, and this is probably not new to many folks on the call, and it's not just a Metro Boston issue, it's a national issue. But since 1990, the number of middle wage working households has fallen, while low and high income working households are growing. And this chart really points out four distinct reasons that's happening. If you look at um, the red and orange lines, those are sort of lower income, uh, lower income jobs, and blue and green are higher income jobs. And if they're on the left side of, of the middle, that means that they're declining. And if they're on the right side, that means they're growing. So we've really seen a decline in core middle income occupations, such as installation, maintenance, and repair, uh, which were sort of the core of our middle income households before the 90s. We've also seen low income growth and middle income decline in occupations such as office and administrative support or care support. So we're seeing more low wage jobs in those particular industries. Uh, we've also seen disproportionate growth in low income fields such as food preparation and serving and disproportionate growth in high income fields such as life and physical sciences. 
So Sasha's going to put up a quick poll for us just to get everyone's brains working. And I want you to think about what percent of Americans do you think said this pre-pandemic in 2017 uh, claimed that they could not handle an expense of more than $100 without worrying about it? Hi, folks. So it's looking like we're having some problems with our polling. So if you could put your answer to this question in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. You can also just think about it. Seems pretty, uh, the technical problems are pretty on brand for today, although I see it's coming up. It looks like most folks are saying 36 or 48 percent. That's correct. So a pre-pandemic national survey that 48 percent of people could not handle an expense of more than a hundred dollars. And this is very heavily related to our wage polarization question, but also has big implications for the pandemic and other extreme changes we might see in our economy. 81% of people said they couldn't handle the expense more than $1,000. And this chart on the right shows that a quarter of Americans in total and even more young folks have no retirement savings. And we know uh, during the pandemic, some folks have had to reach into their retirement savings as well. And uh, just knowing that we are not very resilient to shocks in our economy. As I mentioned earlier in the trends Age polarization, we really have seen a decline in middle wage jobs in our region. We've had a 15% increase in employment between 2010 and 2018, um, but middle wage occupations or industries having middle wage occupations have experienced net losses. So jobs in public administration, manufacturing, and utilities lost nearly 8,000 jobs during that time period, even though the region was growing jobs. And this decline in public administration employment could have a profound impact on workers. Nationally, the median wage earned by Black employees is significantly higher in the public sector than in other industries or the private sector. And so losing those jobs could have profound impacts on Black households in particular. While we've been losing middle wage jobs, we've also seen a shift to these higher end jobs uh, or higher wage jobs. Um, particularly in the innovation economy, which is really an economy driven by knowledge rather than producing things. Um, a report from Massachusetts Housing Partnership years ago found that 15% of the greater Boston was in the innovation economy, which was the second highest concentration after Silicon Valley. What's unique about Boston or Metro Boston is that we are not heavily concentrated in just one or two industries like Silicon Valley is with technology. We have higher education, uh, different types of advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, systems design, consulting services. So we really have spread out our innovation economy sector, which makes us more resilient to changes. But other metro regions across the country have been doing a better job recruiting workers for the past decade. Um, Areas such as Denver, Baltimore, Dallas, and Portland have similarly strong economies and lower cost of living, which has um, been a reason that some folks have moved to those areas. Another pre-pandemic trend that's been lasting a few decades is this increasing power of corporations. Uh, corporations have power both now in the consumer market and the labor market, where very large conglomerates can sort of set price of, of what fair labor is, not necessarily talking about a minimum wage, but just this is generally what we pay. Um, been seen for nurses when there are large mergers of hospitals and also for big corporations like Walmart in the, in the retail space. We have more black merger and antitrust enforcement um, in the past few decades than we had earlier in the 20th century. And uh, a lax use of non-compete clauses and no, non-poaching agreements. And these non-compete clauses were made primarily for higher wage workers who might have trade secrets, but they're increasingly being used for retail workers at places like Walmart so that folks can't leave and have another job somewhere else. Corporations are also increasingly dedicated to making money for shareholders, and less than 10 cents per dollar are invested back in companies today compared to about 40 cents per dollar in the 1970s. And this reinvestment historically focused on higher productivity, innovation, and better wages. We also know that union membership has been declining since the 1950s, which makes it harder for workers to um, work together to demand changes. 
So the National Ontario Planning Council, uh, as you know, is very strongly focused on equity. And in 2017, Jesse Partridge Guerrero led um, our regional indicators project on the state of equity in Metro Boston. This chart is from that project. And we see that there's a huge unequal opportunity um, by race in our region. We've seen um, unemployment rates that are nearly double for black workers, but they were for, for white workers pre-pandemic and almost double for Latinx workers as well. Um, the unemployment rate for disabled workers at the time was over 16%, and that's not even including folks who were sort of encouraged not to even join the workforce or look for work. Uh, this can have really profound impacts on people's ability to make a living wage um, or, or have financial stability. Um, and another group that's not included in the statistics, but nationally we know is also um, disproportionately impacted our folks who have recently experienced incarceration. A report in 2018 studied employment of folks who were formerly incarcerated and found that only 55% of folks um, a year after incarceration had any earnings at all. And this unequal opportunity also expands education. Uh, these are the population, uh, the adult population with bachelor's degrees are higher. Um, for two different time periods in the MAPC region, and we see that um, Black and Latinx workers or adults are much less likely to have a bachelor's degree or higher, which is due to a range of things, but including the cost, um, the cost of higher education. So the last trend I want to talk about that sort of sets us up for the future is thinking about the ways that our labor force will shift in the next few decades. In 2010, baby boomers were about 50% of the region's labor force. This baby boomer generation is uh, whiter than most other generations, that younger generations we have now. And as that baby boomer um, population shifts into retirement, we're going to see a big turnover of workers. Um, this chart here shows the percentage of residents of color in the APC region, which was under 15% in 1990, just over 25% in 2010, and projected to be over 40% in, in the year 2040. So we really can't allow disparities by race and, race and ethnicity to persist that we saw in the last two slides because we're doing a disservice to our future generations and, and really a disservice to our future economy if we continue these disparities in unemployment and um, educational attainment to push forward. So those are all the trends that we've seen over the past few decades. Some of them might not be new to you, but it really sets the stage for what uh, economy we were inheriting going into the pandemic. I'm going to talk a little bit now about how the pandemic has impacted working folks a little bit about the trends that we're going to see going forward, and then turn it over to Betsy to talk about our policy and strategy responses. So this chart shows unemployment claims, uh, continued unemployment claims since the beginning of 2020 through the end of 2020. We see this huge increase starting in March and April as things began to shut down. And it's hard to see here, the white populations in purple, um, you have the Asian population in blue, Black or African American population in pink. So it's a little hard to see here, but the share of folks experiencing unemployment um, by race has actually changed quite a bit throughout this time. So everyone experienced unemployment, but Black and, and African American folks in Asian have experienced that at higher rates than, um, than white folks in our region. And that is a story that is, again, similar across the United States, but very pronounced in our region. We also did some work at IPC over the, the spring and summer to look at the impact of the pandemic um, on people's ability to pay their housing costs. And, and this was really early in the pandemic back in March and April, we looked at all workers in our region, all workers we thought were being laid off based on occupations that they had, and then the workers who would need additional housing assistance even after their CARES Act money came through. So people who, even with an extra $100 a week, would still need housing assistance. And you can see here that about 76% of all workers in the region uh, are white, non-Hispanic, Latino, a slightly uh, greater share, share of uh, people of color, part of that laid off workers, 
But then when you get the folks who need housing assistance, even after receiving that money, um, nearly 50% of those folks are people of color, even though they only make up about 25% of all workers. So again, showing that the disparities in who this, this pandemic is impacting, not just from the public health side, but from the economic side are pretty stark. I also wanted to show this quick chart about uh, the industries uh, that have been most impacted during the pandemic. This is the share of all unemployment claims by certain occupation codes. And uh, this pink line is food preparation and serving. We saw a huge jump uh, again in early March as those um, businesses had to close down. Over the past few months, we have seen a decline in that, but we've seen a, a pretty big increase in the share of people who are unemployed and management occupations, which is a trend for us to keep a, an eye out going forward. This doesn't mean they're necessarily high income occupations, but people who are not necessarily working in food service or construction, as we saw um, with this purple line. So we really need to think about, you know, who is still most at need um, and what other uh, people we need to be targeting assistance going forward. I'm only going to briefly touch on this. Um, but the pandemic has also had unequal impacts on women, particularly women of color. Women of color are some of the hardest hit by the pandemic, partially because of the occupations that they're more likely to, to work in, um, personal care, um, hotel work, and uh, food service work. But we've also seen an exodus of women from the workforce as more burdens of childcare and elder care are placed on them. And we'll actually be having a webinar on this particular topic with a few other experts and, and lawmakers in the next four to six weeks. So keep an eye out for that. The pandemic has also hit undocumented workers harder than probably any other group in our state. Undocumented workers are ineligible for unemployment benefits or federal financial assistance. Um, many undocumented workers are also afraid of of trying to go to their cities or towns for help because of their immigration status. And undocumented workers make up an estimated three to 5% of the total workforce in mass. So that, that's thousands and thousands of people who are in need of help and have to rely right now on local organizations, mutual aid or do, donations to get by if they've lost their job. Another really interesting trend that's come out of this pandemic, I think is that the federal, uh, the federal government to gig workers and the fact that they've, for the first time, really addressed this growth in what we call gig workers who are typically, you know, people who work for themselves, but also kind of work for an app and do side jobs. The Pandemic Employment Assistance Program um, was the first time the federal government created a program similar to unemployment benefits for these gig workers, really recognizing that the, the, uh, it's larger percentage of our economy in the, in the past few decades and really needs, uh, those folks need help. This chart on the left was a survey that found that uh, about a third of folks who said that they drove for Uber or Lyft, Postmates or DoorDash um, had more than 70% of their income going, coming from that source. So a lot, for a lot of people, this is not just extra cash or something they do on the weekend. It's really their primary source of income. And so without this pandemic unemployment assistance, folks would have been in a really tough part, uh, spot. But for those who work gigs for cash or don't necessarily document their tip income, um, they might have a hard time applying for benefits. Um, and that's another group that can sort of slip through the cracks. So we can't talk about the pandemic without talking about the way it's changed commuting. Um, we're all at this meeting from home or maybe from an office, but not where we typically work or with the people we typically work with. This chart is from MassDOT, who's been keeping track of all of the movement in the state, um, especially since the pandemic, and shows what movement has been like compared to 2019. We saw a big decline after the stay-at-home or order, and you see that transit ridership uh, or MBTA rider, which is in this uh, this red color, was hardest hit um, along with airline activity. But bicycle and pedestrian modes have started to rebound and are just below um, pre-pandemic levels. We've also seen uh, an increase in DMT. So that's another trend to watch out for. So people might not be commuting to work as often, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not making car, car trips. 
This is a closer look at the MBTA um, subway in Laurel. And again, we see this huge decline in ridership. But we've seen a rebound through the fall of 2020, through the winter, and uh, the type of ridership has about stabilized to about 30% of pre-pandemic levels. And a closer zoom in, that was subway lines. We also have a, a robust bus system and bus ridership, uh, according to MassDOT, remains at about 50% of pre-pandemic levels. But I think it's important to note that MassDOT is seeing really unequal ridership in their bus lines. There are some lines that serve more frontline workers that are almost, you know, at pre-pandemic levels, and then other lines that are essentially empty. So even with this rebound in ridership, there's sort of a need to redistribute resources um, in the MBTA to make sure we're serving folks who need to use buses more, more frequently. So I know it's a lot of information and some of it might be new, um, but I think it tells a pretty compelling story about where we are today. We had these trends that have been happening for the past few decades, what's happened over the past year, and what I want to talk about now is the trends we keep watching, what we might need to be planning for, and what we are planning for in Metro Common and through uh, some of our other work. So I'm going to highlight three important industries that I think can have really interesting trends for our region. One is care work, which includes uh, personal care for elder folks, child care, home health aids, things like that. And the value of free care services across the U.S. is about $375 billion which is more than a few times what's actually spent in the market. This work is typically low wage and unpredictable schedules. Um, but folks who were asked in a focus group were found that they didn't feel like they had a lot of agency over there because of their lack of control over the schedule. And these occupations have lost over 25,000 high income jobs um, in our region between 1990 and 2014 and only had growth in low income positions. A lot of these uh, home health aid workers are paying minimum wage or just over minimum wage, which could have really disastrous uh, impacts when we have um, a rise in the demand for care work as baby boomers get older and we might not have people willing to work for those wages. Another important industry to Metro Boston that I think you should keep an eye on is higher education. Um, in about 2013, this idea of education started circulating people who think about the future and long-term in the future. They were saying higher education is really expensive. People are coming away with lots of debt. Um, how will colleges and universities fare? Uh, colleges and universities are hiring more adjunct professors, less tenured faculty. Costs are still rising. And I think over the past few years, we've seen the, the closure of a few um, colleges and universities across the state and across the country. And we really not need to start thinking about what is the future of Metro Boston as a high education hub? And what is the future of remote schooling? Um, and if remote schooling becomes more important, <laughs> uh, Jen, I saw that face, that's funny. Um, what does that mean for Metro Boston? So if folks are doing things remotely, does that mean that um, we have impacts on the housing market in Metro Boston or the impacts of, of you know, sort of those agglomeration economies of people all being in one place at once. And the last industry I want us to sort of think about for the future is medical care. So medical care was about 16% of all Metro Boston's employment in 2010. It's projected to grow to about 20% of all employment in 2040. But more than 25% of Americans have reported problems paying medical bills. Um, and a lot of Metro Boston's healthcare profits are sort of fed by this bubble of um, high prescription prices, high, prices, high costs at the hospital. And if we solve the, the problem of high healthcare costs at the federal level, we have to figure out what that means for Metro Boston. If we achieve that change, what are the side effects for our region? That doesn't necessarily mean all the profits go away or um, we won't still be a medical care hub, but, but there are impacts on the type of revenue that this, this region will receive. So I've talked about a few important industries. I'm gonna talk about um, the way that we do work and the way that we commute to work and then turn it over to Betsy. 
So we've done a lot of research into what smarter people than us have been saying about automation while and there isn't a huge consensus about what automation means, but um, I think the, the general consensus is that automation can't take over all of the jobs we have. Um, a few studies found that probably less than 5% of occupations could be entirely automated, but about 60% of occupations have a lot of tasks that could be automated. So even though your job might not go away, the way you do your job might, might change. And there are some tasks that are at higher risk of automation than others. Things like data collection, data processing, or predictable physical work are, are more likely to be automated. Things like accounting or welding on an assembly line. And then we also have some tasks that are, have low risk of automation. Things that um, involve creativity or emotional intelligence like um, personal care or counseling, but we know that a lot of those careers are underpaid and, and it's hard for folks to make a decent living with some of those skills. So I think we'll see a shift over the next few decades about the way that those, those skills are valued. Another trend to sort of keep out for, which, which goes along with the pre-pandemic trends of increasing corporate power is who's gaining from this automation. In past technological revolution, I used to study uh, early 20th century gateway cities. Uh, we saw, you know, if there was a new um, way of manufacturing, a lot of that sort of spread out over to lots of different needs. But we're not producing things in our economy as much anymore. We're producing knowledge and ways of sharing that knowledge and storing that knowledge. And a lot of that is controlled by only a few companies. Um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon are gatekeepers not only to retail, but also search engine and cloud computing and cloud storage. And so as technological advances come up, um, we need to keep an eye on sort of who's benefiting from that um, and, and where that money and time savings are going. I'm gonna skip ahead to uh, some travel trends that um, Connor Gately has looked at with the NASA and MBTA. Um, NASA has been doing a, a panel survey on, uh, of employers asking folks, um, you know, how often are your, are your employees teleworking and how often do you anticipate folks will telework in the future? So right now, about 50% of the people that they've surveyed are almost never in person. It's largely five days a week. About 25% have employees that are coming in one day a week. But going forward, about 70% of organizations say, we'll probably have a lot of things in person, but allow for people to work from home one or two days a week, um, which I, I found those questions interesting about MAPC's office space earlier. And, and I think a lot of folks will have to come to terms with this. Okay, what does it mean if almost all your employees are working from the office three days a week? What does that mean for the amount of space that we'll need? So that's on the employer side. We've also had some folks um, at a best city do surveys on the employee side to see if you know employee and employer expectations match up. I, I should note that this survey is was given primarily to more high income workers, whiter workers in the general workforce, um, and people who could do their jobs from home. But about right now, um, about six percent of folks are working from home every day. Before the pandemic, almost 50% of respondents said, I never teleworked. And people going forward are saying that I, I probably want to telework a few times a week. And so the, the expectations of employees and employers seem to be matching up with about 70% of people saying, yeah, I want to work from home a few times a week, but have the option to go into the office. So I'm going to turn it over to Betsy now to talk about our response um, to all of these trends, the way that we're dealing with them in Metrocom and, and uh, the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, or SEDS, which looks about five years into the future. Um, Sarah, I'm actually going to uh, interrupt for just a second here, if I can, um, before we turn it over to Betsy. There have been a number of questions in the chat. A lot of them are about research, research sources, and we will try and get back to everybody on that. Um, the uh, like many presentations, and we'll put this presentation up uh, and it'll be available for everybody. Like many of our presentations, it involves some original research from MAPC and a lot of research that we're gathering from other sources, because as one of the 
people in the chat said, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We try and do our own work, but also look at what everybody else is doing. Uh, sometimes that means that some of our sources can be for the MBTA region, the MAPC region, or statewide. In a more limited number of cases, we use national sources as well. Uh, some of the research that we've done recently has been, you know, uh, Sarah did a tremendous amount of primary research on the impact of the pandemic recession on people's housing needs uh, and, and published that. That's all available online. Just last week, we came out with a report on the impact of e-commerce. That was our research. And Connor, a few weeks prior to that, completed some really groundbreaking research <coughs> on the impact of land use and transportation pricing policies on VMT, vehicle miles traveled, and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so it is often a combination of research uh, where we do some of it ourselves, but we also try and interpret and bring in the research of other parties. And with that, uh, I will thank Sarah very much for that presentation and turn it over to Betsy for a shorter presentation on our policy responses to some of these issues. Betsy. Great, thank you, Mark. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, great. Sarah, if you could go to the next slide. So what does this all mean for us? And there was a tremendous amount of data. I'm very quickly gonna go through how we're thinking about this for two major planning processes. One underway that will launch in the summer, which is Metrocom, and many of you have been involved in that. But the second is the SEDS, which we recently completed. It was approved by the um, executive committee in January. Every five years, we produce a regional economic development strategy, looking at the, the metropolitan region and what are the strategies that we can implement to advance economic development. This year, we were fortunate that it fell last year because it really allowed us to do a comprehensive plan to advance economic recovery and resilience in the region. If you could go to the next slide. So one thing that I do wanna mention before I get into the issues that we discussed is we worked with an advisory committee made up of a range of different stakeholders and they provided great perspective on all of the ways that COVID and also the increased attention to racial justice will be affecting us over this coming year. So first, again, COVID as it emerged really helped us to rethink some of the issues that would be informing our strategies, our policy recommendations and our programming recommendations as part of the SEDS. Again, public health certainly came to the forefront last year. And as Sarah presented both, you know, how do we think about safe workplaces and helping individuals be healthy? We, Mark mentioned the vaccine rollout earlier, but also building the public health sector, um, as Sarah alluded, certainly thinking about wages and occupations and how do we really strengthen a robust public health sector. Secondly, looking at all of the things that people need to participate and have economic security and prosperity. Two major issues I wanted to highlight there. One certainly is childcare that emerged as a major issue. I know many of you are dealing with that right now, um, but also digital access, not just rural urban, but also thinking about areas of our region where there's unequal access um, to the internet. Sarah mentioned certainly um, industries that are in demand and growing. Last year, we saw biotech, medical manufacturing and other industries that became even more important and thinking about the supply chains for those industries, how do we help individuals enter those industries in terms of workforce development and the supply chain? Uh, but then also, how do we think about geographic diversification of those industries? Certainly, we know that there's major employment centers and there are challenges around who can afford to live close to those employment centers and the transit options to get there. COVID also caused us to really rethink our downtowns and many of you are seeing that in your own communities about vacancy rates and certainly small businesses that are struggling, thinking about the impact of e-commerce and we just re released a report on that. And also the shifts in commercial and office space use as was alluded to the question that Richard mentioned earlier and certainly the data that Sarah presented around telework. And finally, we're really thinking about what are the overall conditions that businesses need to thrive um, under these new conditions again, teleworking, e-commerce, and all of the post-pandemic issues that we'll be facing this year. We could go to the next slide. So the second major issue and that we explored last year as we were developing the SEDS, certainly this was, this was a key focus of the SEDS even before last year, um, but really thinking about increased attention to racial justice as many, many issues emerged over the past year. This was around wealth creation options. So as Sarah presented, how do we address wage disparity in these key occupations? How do we help individuals generate more savings? Thinking about how many, many people um, couldn't survive losing one paycheck. Um, so how do we have children's savings accounts and support intergenerational wealth transfer? 
And then how do we increase the resiliency and stability of businesses that are owned by BIPOC population, which is black, indigenous, and other people of color? And then what are the other elements that help people really participate actively in our economy and generate wealth? Certainly stable housing, and that was a major issue last year around the eviction moratorium and support for individuals. Um, but also we did a lot of work and certainly we had some business partners on our advisory committee really thinking about the private sector role in workforce development and supplier diversity. Um, and I do wanna make a note here, this plan really is calling on you know, certainly it's directing the work of MAPC, but it's calling on our partners in the private sector and nonprofit sector to work with us on the strategies that I'll talk about in a second. So certainly we need all elements um, of that. And quickly we'll go um, to the next slide and I'll just talk about um, how the goals of Metro Common respond to the information that Sarah presented and then also um, briefly touch on the goals and strategies of the SEDS. So first I'll just make a note, all of the goals in Metro Common ultimately touch on these trends that we were talking about, right? The future of work involves where we live, how we get to work, um, but there's three goals that I did wanna highlight. So the first is around getting around the region. So traveling around the region, which is safe, affordable, convenient, and enjoyable. Economic security, and we certainly saw that last year, and that's one of the major pillars of the SEDS, which I'll present in a second. And then what does it look like for everyone in the, uh, the greater Boston region um, to be economically prosperous? Go to the next slide. So we used all of that information that Sarah presented, and then we developed a series of goals, again, working with our advisory committee and an internal group of staff, whom I wanna thank. Um, and we came up with three major goals. And again, this is a five-year plan. So these are lofty goals, but I'll talk about the strategies that we developed that will help us achieve these goals. So first is around financial stability. Um, again, knowing how precarious, you know, we saw that 48% statistic around people who can't afford a major expense. So how do we help individuals achieve financial stability? The second is around increased parity between the wealth of the BIPOC population and white people in the region, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, it's this third goal, as I mentioned, we think about geographic diversification of industries. Where can people afford to live who work in those industries? And then what are the transportation options that are able to connect people um, to their homes, to their jobs, and to other elements of their lives? You could go to the next slide. So very briefly, um, goal number one, again, this is around financial stability. So this is thinking about workforce development supports. And again, we had a particular focus on the BIPOC population in the region based on the data that Sarah presented and based on conversations with our advisory committee. Obviously, all of these strategies benefit the wider region as well. But we specifically wanted to address the, the severe wealth gap and the ways that the pandemic particularly affected the BIPOC population. So how can we partner with the private sector to advance workforce development and also address these barriers to employment? The second is around financial um, resources. So how do we both increase protections um, against predatory lending, but then also expand access to financial services? So what are the opportunities to partner um, with a range of, of different folks in the financial sector and others? And then finally, as we saw last year from the federal government, certainly there's increased thinking around publicly funded income enhancements and several communities are testing that right now. What would that look like to support individuals who don't um, have a living wage? And how can the government also work with other partners to support reduction in household expenses? Our second goal um, was around thinking about parity between the wealth of the BIPOC population and the white population. So if you could advance the slide. And we had four major areas there. So first thinking about stable housing. And again, that came up in our data, that came up in a lot of the conversations that we had with our advisory committee and other stakeholders. This is both thinking about rental housing, but also certainly thinking about home ownership. And what are the new creative options that we can think about to provide stable housing? The second is around resiliency and stability of businesses. And I'll just say, this is broad. This touches on all of our thinking around downtown revitalization, we're about to embark on a number of projects around the region focusing on downtowns. So again, thinking about BIPOC owned businesses, but also broadening that um, to think about overall business districts and the vitality of the small business sector. I will make a note that tonight, we're actually doing a film screening of a storytelling project on Asian owned businesses that was done over the past year, looking at the impact of the pandemic on those businesses in particular in Quincy. The third is really thinking about you know, community-driven economic systems. Last year, we saw a number of different creative strategies to support neighbors, mutual aid societies, and ways that other people invested in local businesses. 
So how can we work with partners to support those kind of community and local economic systems? And finally, we talked with our advisory committee um, and the executive committee about advancing tax reform and what are the ways that we can think about shifts um, we need to explore and research this, but shifts um, in the way we're thinking about taxes to address some of these systemic inequities. And finally, our third goal is related to the intersection between where people can afford to live, where the jobs are located, and the transportation. So really those three. So it involves certainly thinking about affordable housing, your employment centers and transit nodes. The second issue, and this really was not on our radar before last year, is just digital access, right? And this is all that Sarah presented around telework. Um, how do we expand digital access? We're embarking on a number of projects in Chelsea, Revere, and Everett thinking about digital access. And finally, um, certainly working with a range of partners, how do we provide access to affordable, safe, safe and accessible transportation options? So as I wrap up, I'll briefly talk about, on the next slide, I'll talk about um, how we're thinking about implementation. And essentially there's three major ways that we will be moving forward on implementation of the SEDS. Again, this fits under the Metro Common kind of 30 year strategy. This is thinking about a five year strategy. So first we're advancing regional recovery and resilience work. So this is working with our partners at the municipal and regional level on plans and program recommendations and then capacity building with our partners. The legislative agenda, which was um, MEPC's le legislative agenda, was recently approved by the executive committee. And this really sets out a range of options for us to advance economic recovery and resilience um, in, in partnership with a number of different players. And finally, research. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll highlight some of the completed and pending research that we'll be focusing on. So the left-hand side highlights some of our completed research. Some of it was presented this morning, um, but certainly thinking about obviously changes in work and um, the commercial displacement and how businesses have been affected um, down to e-commerce and, and looking at a range of ways that housing will be affected. We did a recent report um, certainly focusing on um, municipal workforce and also the zoning atlas, um, which was recently released. In pending research, there's a number of topics, um, industrial land use and looking at that around the region. Again, manufacturing was a huge um, support this year um, and, and is an emerging industry. And so how do we you know, think about industrial land use with the other land use pressures? Retrofitting suburbia is really thinking about how do we um, rethink strip malls and other underutilized commercial space and what are the creative options there? Certainly thinking about residential, residential displacement. And finally, thinking about all of the different research that, and you know, certainly the question was asked in the chat, but as we move forward, um, this is unprecedented time. So we'll be thinking about, you know, what are the data that we can collect from our region, from our partners, and what are the best practices around the region that will need to advance economic recovery and resilience. So that is the end of our presentation. We wanted to open it up for questions, both on the data and on the strategy. So I'll turn it over to Mark. So don't be shy, folks. We need we need you to ask some questions or make some comments and let us know what you're interested in via the chat. When we are sitting in a hotel room or in a ballroom uh, holding one of these council meetings, there is never a lack of hands. But uh, uh, on on Zoom, sometimes it can be challenging. The uh, uh, presenters, uh, Betsy and Sarah, and also Connor, uh, who's our expert researcher on transportation are ready and able to entertain some questions. Uh, and uh, we are glad to do so if you put them in the chat or if you indicate that you would like to be called upon. So far, I'm not seeing anyone, but I know if we get one person, then we'll have a flood of people after that. While you think of that, I might say one thing that came to my mind uh, and has come to my mind in listening to this, um, in listening to this work and in talking with my staff generally. And that is that you know, right now, it's very easy for people to look at this tremendous, tremendous impact of the pandemic and say it's going to change everything. And you know, it's, it's become popular for people to say, no one will go back on transit, nobody will live in the city anymore and everyone will work from home. And it's important to remember that there will probably be some motion in those directions, but people do not make their judgments based only upon what's happened in the last year. They don't completely change their perspectives and they don't completely change their life stories. Uh, and I think what we're going to see in the future is an impact of these adjustments, 
accompanied by all of these other critical trends that predate the pandemic and are still going on, which Sarah and Betsy spoke about so, about so much. It's important to remember that they don't go away. So uh, I see that Jared raised his hands and uh, his hand, and then we have some other questions. That's excellent. Uh, Jared Johnson from Transit Matters. You Great. Unmute awesome. yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. And and Mark, you you, you kind of hit on a, a kind of hit on the the point I was I was going to the, the question I was gonna I was gonna ask, you, which is exactly that is which is, you know there there is this um, you know there is definitely the the, the story um, you know sort of being told in the media and a lot of sort of common um, you know common sense around you know what folks think the future of work will be. Yet at the same time, you know um, still you know there's you know high rise buildings going on high rise buildings going up downtown and and continued announcements about um you know large um large employers continuing to you know to want to have um offices you know located next to transit and and yeah so I, it was just interested to see to um interested in, in just you know how how that will impact the uh, metro common you know sort of planning processes is yeah I could comment on that, but let me let me see if uh, Betsy or Sarah or Connor want to say anything in response to that question, since I've already touched on it a little bit. Oh, I think I'll turn that over to Betsy. Great, thanks, Jared. You know, we've we've talked a lot about this, certainly with our um, chamber partners and others. What is this going to look like? Um, and, and you know, frankly, the word post-pandemic, you know. Maybe there's not a post, right? We're, we're moving into kind of a new scenario. Um, and I think there's lots of different thinking. Um, certainly there's gonna be some impacts um, even just on kind of our own, you know, how often folks are going into the office. What does that mean for the other businesses that are near office space and how they will survive? Um, and then also how does this really shift again, um, kind of where folks decide to live. Um, the, all of that we're kind of thinking out more broadly. We've been talking a lot with the South Shore Chamber of Commerce on you know, kind of some of the, tr the trends that they're seeing there um, and, and saying, maybe it won't change quite as much. There might be more people that would be returning to the office, um, but certainly it might spread out some of the commutes or help people really think differently about how they're using their time in the office and how often they're going in. So I'll just say it's a big, big question, but then you know, we're also thinking about how does that then affect all of the other businesses, the downtowns and the others, you know, certainly think about downtown Boston and all of the small businesses there that depended on the workforce coming in has been significantly affected. So um, it's not an eloquent answer to your question, Jared. I think it's something that- No, you, no, you, that's fine. The, the, the question got, got a little less, uh, the question itself got a little less eloquent because like I said, Mark um, touched on a lot of it, but no, I think that's that, that's critical. And, and like you were saying, you know, it's really about the the businesses around there, they're right, that, that even if, you know, if you have, 20, 20 or 25 percent less people coming into the office and then some of the folks who are coming into the office are coming in a little bit later and then maybe they're not going to lunch well that's right. a big deal uh for restaurants that have really thin margins and depend on the lunch crowd only because of how single use particularly downtown boston is or uh, areas like kindle although that's getting better so but yes thanks thanks exactly. betsy. thanks thanks jared and betsy carol uh blair i see has a question carol would you unmute yourself and ask your question about development in roxbury Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, the other night I attended a meeting of the um, Thor, the, the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee, and a couple of members raised the point that although economic development has been promised or it was requested by the Master Plan Oversight Committee, and it has been promised by developers that um, consistently the, the space that is developed has been hard to fill. And then developers say, well, we just, we're just gonna do housing then. So we're, we're going further toward um, um, a lopsided community and um, we need a new strategy. We need new resources. What would they be? Well, Betsy has done a lot of uh, work, spent much of her career on economic development issues in Boston. So I'm gonna ask Betsy to also uh, provide some thoughts on that issue. Sure, thanks for the question, Carol. And I'll just say it's a complex one. So I won't, won't pretend to give a, you know, a, a complete answer in a couple of minutes, but certainly it's been, a, it's been a big challenge in Roxbury. I worked with a number of the businesses that are in the bowling building, uh, really dependent on kind of the you know, BPS, the Boston Public School staff who were there and really hoping that that would be a catalyst. And it's been challenging. I think there's a number of issues that play in there in terms of you know, how do we support housing? As you mentioned, certainly housing is important, but also you need to have businesses 
um, to provide, you know, economic activity and really build Roxbury so that you say it's, it's a more complex community. I know there's a number of organizations um, that are thinking about that. How do we have more kind of cooperative owned businesses and more businesses that might be more sustainable over time? Um, I've been working with a couple of folks that are, you know, thinking about business activity in Roxbury, but it's challenging. So it involves, you know, again, um, how do we do business district revitalization? What are the um, public space um, improvements there? How do we help people come to the district and um, how do we expand the range of products and services that are offered by the businesses that are there currently? Um, how do we do marketing to encourage more folks to come and populate those businesses and really support them? Um, and then what are, again, the transportation options that are getting folks there? Obviously, you know, Nubian Square now has, you know, certainly it's a major transit hub and it always has been, but how do we make sure that people are aware um, of the transit options that are there? Um, so it's a very, very challenging question. I know a lot of organizations are really dedicated to that and thinking about it and I'd be happy to follow up with you offline. And I'll add a point to that as well. You know, we, one of the things we do at MAPC is we try to get people out of their silos. A lot of times we try and answer, you know, we answer the economic development questions over here. and We answer the housing questions over there. and We answer the transportation questions in the next room. And the reality is that everything relates to everything else. One of the issues consistently facing Roxbury and other lower income communities, and of course, Roxbury is not exclusively a lower income community, but on average, uh, is the wage polarization issue that Sarah talked about before. Uh, economic development depends on markets. It depends on people buying stuff, services and goods. And yet we're living in a time when low wage workers are earning less, high wage workers are earning more, and middle class jobs are disappearing. And that is going to have a tremendous impact. It's one of the reasons why at MAPC you should know that our economic development work used to be focused almost entirely on real estate development, job creation, we sometimes called it, but it was really real estate development. And when we brought Betsy on and even before her, when uh, Amanda Chisholm was running economic development, we have been engaged in a major shift at MAPC that you can see in the SEDS to focus on the workforce issues as being equally important, if not more important than the real estate development issues, because those underlying dynamics, which are hard to see and even harder to influence, are often what affects our efforts to try and have success in commercial development, in housing development, or in many of the other issues that we're trying to grapple with in the future. Um, I see there were some other questions. I'm having a little difficulty going through the chat, but I see Jim O'Connell has a question about office space, not only in Boston, but along suburban routes as well. Uh, Jim, would you like to ask your question? Well, I'm going to ask it for him if he's having difficulty unmuting, perhaps. Jim asked, what is the prognosis for office space, particularly in Boston's downtown, but also office parks along suburban beltways, et cetera? Uh, is there any research? Uh, and uh, we are doing a lot of work on, uh, on commercial revitalization. Uh, again, I think I'm going to turn to Betsy to answer that. We're happy to answer. And I'll just, I'll give you an unsatisfying answer, which is that yes, there's some, certainly there's been a lot of thinking about the future of work, but a lot of it is, is unknown. Um, you know, you heard Richard's question to us earlier about how we're thinking about our office space. I know, you know, a lot of employers are really, right now as releases are coming up, are, are thinking how often do we need workers um, in our spaces? Are there other creative uses? And frankly, also some companies are hiring um, from other parts of the region and the employers are actually staying there. So uh, we don't know how much of a trend that's going to be, but certainly some companies are saying, do we actually need to have staff? Can we do a nationwide search and have someone based in other parts of the country? So I think we'll see that play out over the next couple of years, again, as, as kind of vaccines roll out and then folks figure out how often do we need to be back into work? You know, I'll say some, some employers that I've talked to have really missed um, the opportunity to work collaboratively. There's something that you miss um, in a two-dimensional screen, um, but others are really saying, is this a cost savings? And then certainly there's been some thinking, could those office spaces that are underutilized commercial spaces be reutilized in some way? Could it be housing potentially? And there's lots of conversation pro and con about that. Could it be used for other creative business incubation endeavors or educational spaces? What are the other options for office space? So we, you know, our team is gonna be digging into that research um, as we continue to work on economic recovery. Um, and certainly I also see a question here around um, downtown revitalization, similar question. Um, as we think about you know, small business closures over the past year, we've also seen some businesses start 
although we've had you know many many business closures and that's affected our downtowns and so how do we work with property owners um, on new uses for those spaces or again incubating new businesses um, and then how do we support overall district revitalization so we're going to be embarking on a number of projects um, starting in a couple of weeks in several downtowns um, so any questions on the chat i'd be happy to talk to those folks further as we get into our research and the, and the options for downtowns and I think I'm going to give the last question to uh, my friend, John Sisson, uh, who works for the town of Dedham and I think plays a role in Newton where he lives, if I recall correctly, and used to be at the Mass Smart Growth Alliance. John. Uh, good morning. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, Betsy addressed it. I think there's a lot of questions we're seeing. I attended a ULI um, presentation a week or two ago about life sciences and, and changes and, and them looking out at 495 and, and Burlington and other areas. So. We we're wondering down here on the 128 South, um, we have a fairly soft office market now. Um, we do have questions about how it might affect our tax levy uh, since we do have a split rate. And, um, but yeah, wondering, you know, if uh, life science starts moving out of Cambridge a little bit, is that gonna displace some people and, and maybe, you know, we'll, we'll be here to catch them. I don't know, but um, I think there are, are questions. I think you, you addressed my question earlier. So now I'm just rambling, but, um, but thank you. No, and John, I know that one. I'll go ahead, briefly Betsy. on your life sciences um, point. We did a project a couple years ago, led by um, a couple of staff on my team, looking at Quincy, Braintree, and Somerville as places where businesses that either couldn't afford Kendall or weren't appropriate for Kendall could could look at, you know, a slightly lower quality office space that they would need for their manufacturing operations, and then the connection to workforce. Right, Quincy College is right in Quincy. How would that allow more people to enter in the life sciences workforce? So I think it's an exciting question, you know, certainly there might be some, some push of businesses outside of Cambridge and other key areas. You do mention displacement, that's something we have to think about, you know, would that displace other manufacturing uses, but this could be an interesting opportunity. Thank you, uh, Betsy. Also a big thank you to Sarah and to Connor. Uh, this was a big presentation to pull together in a relatively short period of time on an interesting subject, really an interesting series of subjects. And I thank everyone for participating and for their questions. But now uh, it is 1130 and we need to end our council meeting. And for that, I am going to turn it back over to our president, Aaron Wartman. Uh, thank you, Mark. And thank you, um, <coughs> staff. Thank you, everyone, for such a great meeting. What an engaging conversation. What really interesting data. And uh, may this be the kind of the catalyst for us to continue these conversations. I hope my technical difficulties are finished, uh, fingers crossed. And with that, I don't believe there's any other business not known at the time of the posting before us. So with that being said, thank you, Frank from Quincy. You read my mind. Uh, I see Frank from Quincy has a motion to adjourn. If uh, someone could give me a second, thank you, John DePriest from Chelsea. Um, that being said, if there are no other questions or comments, please enter your vote in the chat. And I am seeing everyone come in. This is amazing. And thank you so much. And with that, I will take the liberty of saying the motion passes in the meeting. Uh, the Winter Council meeting for MAPC is adjourned at 1130 on the dot. Great job, everyone. Um, I look forward to seeing you all, albeit virtually, at the annual council meeting in May. Um, and until then, stay safe, uh, get vaccinated, and have a great day.